most of this is some various bits of research, exploratory research, some of which I presented earlier this year and quite a bit more I've done recently. So a few simple questions for you to think about. Uh, you know, do you read very well, you read fast? Can you read well on a small device, a small screen device? You know, here is a fully optimized question for a mobile device. It's still hard to read for many people. <coughs> Similarly, you know, are you good at typing? Can you type well on, on your small mobile phone? Um, maybe the, in the future you'll be worrying about how quickly you can speak clearly as an as a important skill to have. So if you agree, as I do, that, that in the future we're going to be reading less and listening more, you know, we're going to be perhaps uh, typing a little bit less and um, you know, talking more into devices more, you know, then as we change these behaviors in our everyday life, then we have to adapt our research technologies uh, to, to fit these lifestyle changes. So we have to figure out how to make our research work with voice technology. <clears throat> Some other questions that you know, we've thought about over the last 10 years, for example, there, were, there was a long time, 10 years ago, people were saying online research you know, wasn't representative. It probably wasn't originally. Um, similarly, you know, not that long ago before MRMW came into a, uh, creation, you know, research was really just done on computers. <laughs> And, and now uh, we're seeing a lot of great research coming through mobile devices. Uh, so today, still, most people would assume that you know, online research requires typing. But that doesn't necessarily, we'll, that will challenge that assumption, I think, over the next couple of years. I think also, you know, while I'm tackling that topic, I'd like to bring up this other issue, which is that you know, most people have, have fixated on, on the, the importance of closed-end type questions at the expense of open-ended questions. And I think that's uh, another assumption that we'll be challenging over the next couple of years. I'll talk a bit about that. And even the very uh, question that you know, mobile research is about survey taking. Um, I'm not sure that that'll always be the case. So what is the problem we're trying to solve here? So <clears throat> this may seem a bit uh, odd, but you know, if you think about handwriting, it's really an input device that's no longer being used, no longer being taught in elementary schools across the world the way it was when we were young. Uh, or at least when I was young. Um, <clears throat> in some places, certainly in the States, they haven't taught it in 20 years. So there's a whole generation of people that are growing up that don't know how to write. They can print, but they can't write. Similarly, you know, not that long ago, you used to walk into an office building, you'd see filing cabinets everywhere. Today, you don't see that anymore. That, that storage device or that, that uh, device has gone away. So today, typing as a way to input information is king, but I'm not sure that it's going to stay that way. I think that uh, voice technology will, will gain um, ground quite quickly. And the reason for that is quite simple. People are spending more and more time on small screen devices uh, that's difficult to both type into and read. And even smaller devices are, are catching on, such as wearables of various types, watches, and so forth. So as a result of some of these trends, <clears throat> surveys are changing. We certainly hope that they're getting shorter. We've been, as an industry, pushing for that for some time. We feel there's a compelling need for, for surveys to get shorter. And they're incre increasingly being completed on mobile devices. So with that in mind, most of the companies out there that are in the survey business, such as my company, you know, they have guidelines and recommendations. And the recommendations, almost to a one I've seen, all suggest start to limit your, you know, try to limit your uh, open-ended questions, particularly on mobile. Why? Because <clears throat> it's hard to type on a small device. Uh, we've done quite a bit of research which has shown that on average people type less words in an open-ended question when they complete the survey on a mobile device. It's about 20% less on a mobile device, about 10% less on a tablet on average. Um, <clears throat> so you know, my point is you know, not to s seek to phase out open-ended questions, but rather to, to make better use of the capabilities inherent in these, in these devices uh, that, that have the ability to make use of, of mobile uh, uh, voice data collection, particularly voice to text in this case. So another aspect of this to consider, <clears throat> a, a change that I see happening, say, over the next five years, is that today there is still this big divide between qualities and quant people. Qualitative researchers are still fixated on you know, very small groups of, of respondents, open-ended, deep insight type of research. Um, so there's two continuums here, sort of the uh, dynamic input versus static input, or open-end versus closed-end, and qual versus quant. And today there's, there's this 
this is process where people often start with qual and then eventually move on to quantitative research. Uh, but as we see that uh, in time, you know, we're getting compressed on uh, surveys have to be, and, and research has to be delivered much quicker. The, the opportunity to throw something over the, to somebody else is, is changing. Also, you know, with the new technology, with communities, with, with some of the discussion forums and other technologies that are out there, the ability to do high, uh, larger scale, uh, deep insight work is, is improving. So where I see us coming is sort of some, some change towards the middle here where there won't be that differentiation in the future. In five years, I don't think we'll be talking about these the two different disciplines between qualitative and quantitative research. It'll be, you know, at scale, deep insights. And in that kind of environment, the way you do that is through uh, asking people questions and, uh, and, again, letting them respond to you in the way that's most comfortable for them. So I did a couple of uh, small bits of research earlier this year um, where we, <clears throat> and this is where the, the technology is still a bit of a challenge, you know, trying to get people to turn on these features. Every mobile phone in this room has the features available to either read the survey back to you or to, uh, to take your voice and, and translate it into text. You probably all know that, but most people don't even know these features exist, never mind know how to turn them on on their device. Uh, so for us to, to do a research project, you know, we have to stumble over a few logistical issues to try and get people to say, okay, on your phone, go to settings and do this and do this and go to the accessibility area and switch on this and, and swipe down two fingers like this and now the survey will read to you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but we went through that. Uh, so first, uh, text to voice, which is essentially, you know, having the survey read the questions to you on the device. Everybody's phone here can do it. Um, we, we found that some people were quite surprised, first of all, at the feature that the phone could talk to them that way. Um, others found it very useful. Some said, I'd rather just read. And others found that the tone of the voice monotonous or aggravating or, or various other things. But the point of the matter is some people loved it. <clears throat> and uh, about a third of people found it useful. And about a third found some problems with it. But in time, I think this will be more widespread. We then also did a similar test on uh, voice to text. So um, in this case, about 21 out of 50 people had used that feature before. Uh, and again, we had a mixture of people, some loving it, some hating it. Um, you know, some people use it all the time for other things, and, uh, and others never really use it. So I'm suggesting, well, maybe I'm being, reaching a bit far here, but you know, we've, we've probably many of you have seen these kinds of d diagrams where now the phone is sort of that, that personal device that's connecting all these different things that you're doing in your life so that, so that we can connect your banking and your healthcare data and all this other data. I think I'm suggesting that what we're really moving to is, is a, a, a situation where all this information is sitting up there in the cloud and the, the, the authentication and the connecting is increasingly going to be tied to voice biometrics. Already in the US, you know, they're advertising extensively on TV for this bank that's using voice uh, authentication as a way to get into the bank, showing, like many of you that have challenges trying to, trying to get into the passwords and remembering the password and all this stuff. One voice you know, command could potentially get you into any, any, uh, any one of the different things that you need a, uh, authentication for. So I think that within a couple of years, many of you will be using voice biometrics or your fingerprint or other ways, but voice biometrics I think will be a big one for accessing a lot of your information. And again, just another illustration where you'll be, it'll be a more commonplace thing for you to be talking into these devices. It'll be something you'll be doing every day. <clears throat> so what we were looking at in this, in, in terms of voice technology is a research enabler. Certainly it helps with either literate, uh, non-literate or pre-literate, such as children, uh, situations. Um, when you're out on the go uh, and, and you don't really want to type, uh, talking into a device is in, in, for capturing in the moment research can be quite helpful. Uh, if you're like me and need reading glasses, uh, you know, even uh, with a small screen device, sometimes it's helpful. You don't want to find your reading glasses, you know, you can just have the thing read to you. <clears throat> Our belief is that, you know, this technology, and, and even when you get into other populations, such as we're talking about in developing countries where you know, these, these things can automatically translate into 20 languages. If you have a country with a lot of different dialects and a lot of different country, a lot of different uh, languages, it can dynamically, uh, the, the technology is coming along where it can dynamically translate on the fly uh, and speak to you. Um, and I think that'll be helpful as well. 
We did a separate study, a little larger study, a little later this year, uh, to look at how it would work with, with children. Uh, so we did sort of uh, two different studies, a couple hundred people each. First one, uh, <clears throat> you know, this, this, this survey will read to you. You know, just hover over the question, it'll talk to you. Uh, and then the, the other way, uh, speak your answers to certain questions instead of typing them. Um, <clears throat> we found in this particular group of, of respondents that they really loved it. For, by and large, you know, they, they said it was easy to understand um, the text. Some of the kids were a little shy. Uh, shyness is an issue, which will, will be a, a factor in talking into a phone or taking a picture or anything else. It'll be an issue in the way we collect data. But over time, people will get beyond that, I think. Um, so long and short of it is, a, long pe a lot of people loved it. A lot of kids thought it was pretty uh, fun. Uh, similarly, when we did the voice to text, they liked it, it's easy to use. Some did, found it hard to work. Um, some wanted to type like a big boy. Um, but we had a, a mix of responses. But uh, by and large, it showed that there's certainly a group of people that would prefer to have this feature. And when we looked at their, their satisfaction with the approach, both text to voice and voice to text among children, uh, was, was, was quite strong, a little less so among adults. So how do you deploy the voice technology? Well, this is where it gets a little complicated, problems that we'll solve over the next year or two. But you know, there's sort of, you could deploy it through the operating system, so on the Android, the iPhone, the Windows. But you have to then have specific instructions for every type of device on exactly how you activate it. Um, that's a little tricky. You can do the survey system. And some of the survey systems are building in these features now. Uh, like Dimensions had, had the uh, text-to-voice feature in it we were using. I've been testing a couple of other ones. Um, so that, that'll be out there before long. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, though, they're typically just working on Chrome. So that's a bit of a limitation. Uh, apps, there's no reason why these can't be built into apps as an additional input device. The only difference is one of the advantages, of course, of apps is they can work offline and when you're using voice-to-text or text-to-voice, you need to be connected to, the, to an online um, application. So if, if anybody want to try some of these things on, there's either apps that can be either used on PCs or mobile devices. Here's a few different um, um, companies that, that uh, have, have applications that have various features, such as like the simultaneous translation and other things that are, I was mentioning you could dictate into. Um, what I was doing was, was, was capturing, in another test, capturing some audio files and then putting them into here and, and doing some translating them into text and various things. Found them very useful. Um, <clears throat> one thing to keep in mind, though, is, is when we do the research, just did another study this year, survey research is largely done at home. 88% of people are doing their surveys at home. Another 7% are doing it at the office. So 95% of the time, people are doing it at home. They're doing research at home, and then this is, goes back to that context presentation we saw earlier. Uh, when they're doing it at home, what else are they doing? They're doing a lot of other things. They're, they're multitasking. In this case, 60% of the people reported they were doing something else while they were taking the survey. Uh, you know, about 37% of them are watching TV. Other people were uh, surfing other things, reading, eating, you name it. Uh, <clears throat> so if you're doing all of these different things, um, you know, it, it's a... Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting context. If you want to speak, for example, into a phone, you know, maybe the, if the TV's on, that's a challenge. You know, it, uh. um, <clears throat> so another application, uh, we talked about uh, Siri. Uh, I hadn't actually mentioned it, but voice search. Uh, I was able to connect through, this, our, through our metered uh, telephones, uh, so our metered devices. We have some mobile metered uh, phones in our panel. And we've looked at the Siri sessions that they used. And we're able to actually, by checking the GPS, see if they were actually moving or not. And so it seems as though most of the time when people um, use Siri, 63% of the time they were outside their home. Um, and, more, and about 44% of all the Siri sessions, or about 70% of those ones when they're outside the home, they're actually moving more than four miles an hour, so more than just walking pace. So voice uh, applications like that are being used more frequently out of the home, typically when they're moving because of convenience, as we would suspect. So where are we going with this? Uh, <clears throat> I see it as sort of a circle. If you remember back in the, the caddy days, there was interviewer-assisted or face-to-face -face or other uh, interviewer days. There were those types of conversations where people were, were probing you and, you, and we had uh, 
uh, some great research, I think. And then along came on, online and self-completion diaries. We lost some of that, we lost the interview of bias, but on the other hand, we lost a lot of that probing ability. When we went from that transition, many of you may remember, like the average uh, unaided brand awareness mentions dropped from about six to about three. You know, we didn't do as good a job in online at that probing stuff. As we're moving further into, you know, where we're going with guided self-completion using artificial intelligence, which will, I think it is, it's almost like coming back to the caddy days. It's returning to the conversation approach to research. <clears throat> it's, it's a long ways off, probably five or 10 years before we really have good scale ways of doing this. But ultimately I see research becoming back to voice technology. Uh, only the conversation is gonna be humans with computers. And so in summary, um, I see that I wouldn't say that voice to te text or text to voice is necessarily ready for mainstream just yet. Um, but I would say that it's, it's an interesting option that's gaining momentum. I'd say that uh, as people use more and more uh, of the features of voice and to text and text to voice, that uh, people will come to expect uh, their surveys and their other research instruments to, to have that feature. Um, I like to think in terms of, you know, there's a buzzword in the industry of of uh, device agnostic, uh, and I think that that's wrong. I think the right word is input agnostic. We shouldn't care how people collaborate with us. We just want them to collaborate. We want to let them collaborate in the way that they're most comfortable, whether it's speaking into a device, typing into that device, or other means. Um, I could say about text to voice is good for pre-literate, non-literate groups, um, <clears throat> or when you're driving, as one of our respondents said. Um, specific situations or populations such as children but not necessarily a key driver of in innovation. On the other hand, I think that voice to text will be a, a very useful option that many people will, will take advantage of because you know, people can speak. Certainly I speak much faster than I type. <clears throat>